Lawyers of Reddit, what's the most ridiculous argument you've heard in court? As a corporate lawyer, the most ridiculous argument I come across almost monthly is as follows. Fortune 500 company signs a garbage contract and is going to lose a lot of money due to the plain language of that contract. Fortune 500 company argues unconscionability, specifically that said company was not sophisticated enough to read the contract and no reasonable person would ever agree to the term or terms in dispute. In some, multi-billion dollar firms claiming they are incapable of reading contracts. Law student, former professor story, defendant busted for possession of narcotics, they were in the pocket of his leather jacket. He argues the search was illegal, because with his buttery smooth leather jacket, there's no way the officer would have felt the drugs in his pocket during a pat down, so he shouldn't have reached in the pocket to find the drugs in the first place. Judge asks if the jacket is the one he was currently wearing in court, it was. Judge asks to feel this jacket in the pockets. Defendant hands it to the bailiff. Judge finds more drugs in the pocket. Needless to say, it didn't go well for him. I was a juror, but this was a hell of a defense. Defendant ran through a red light and crossed against traffic in front of an officer. She was over twice the limit. It wasn't her fault. She had a cut on her arm that her dog licked. The yeast from the dog's saliva entered her bloodstream and converted her blood sugar into alcohol. An opposing attorney the other day said I should not cross-examine his witness at a preliminary hearing because it would only hone the witness's testifying skills to be cross-examined at trial. I laughed out loud. Oh geez where do I start? I mean I could tell plenty of these about my own clients, but I like this one, a lady has an injury slash calm case. It's for her upper back and of course complex regional pain syndrome. She decides she needs the insurance company to pay for a special mattress for her, like a $6,000 memory foam with heat and massage and a thousand other features, and not just a twin. She needs a California king, because of course her layabout unemployed boyfriend needs to sleep there too. We spend months litigating this damn thing. Finally, she buys it herself, and my client agrees to give her $1,500, just to be done with it. The judge takes myself, and opposing counsel aside, and says he's gonna a third arcus, if we ever say the word mattress in his court again, after wasting all this time. It was that ridiculous. Not 3 months go by and the case comes on for another hearing. After exhausting all the chiropractic care allowed under the law, her doctor was seeking a variance to get some additional chiropractic. We get to court, and I'm arguing it should be denied, etc. Judge turns to her and says, ma'am, why do you feel you need more chiropractic care? She pauses for a minute then says, I'm having a lot of trouble sleeping on my mattress. I think I saw smoke coming out of his ears. In family court hearing a motion for entry of a restraining order for an abusive husband. Husband's lawyer argues that in a marriage, there is implied consent for a certain amount of abuse slash violence. I have a brief encounter personal injury prospect. Old lady slipped and fell on an icy driveway which was not salted or maintained. So she wanted to sue for damages. After hearing the story, turns out the lady fell on her own driveway which she did not salt maintain. She was wanting to sue herself. Had a pro SE litigant argue that she didn't owe the credit card company because Jesus. The basic argument was that debt is a sin or maybe not paying the debt was a sin. And Jesus died for all of our sins. Therefore Jesus died to pay off her debt. Brilliant. I was in the public gallery for this while studying law. I was not the lawyer. Leeds Crown Court back in the early 90s. 75 yo foreign yes, this is important man was facing a preliminary hearing at relating to charges that he had sexually touched a 13 yo relative. His barrister made a successful plea for bail based upon this man being an established pillar of the immigrant community and the judge asked the old man if he had anything to say before he was bailed until the next hearing in a month. He made two comments one she was wearing very very tight shorts and I should not be held responsible because no real man could resist see something like that. The judge reminded his this was a preliminary hearing not a trial so he should wait until the trial to argue his case especially statements that are far from exculpatory and are better suited to mitigation to I cannot reappear in a month.
because I'm flying back to my home country tomorrow and will not be coming back. The barrister appeared to be just as surprised as the rest of us. The judge ordered the defendant's passport seized and he was remanded in custody until his trial. I heard this story from a cop. A man was arrested for charges of assault and great this was in Oklahoma and I'm in Texas so I'm not sure what the offense is called there. Anyway, he was being accused of shoving the women on the ground where there was some debris and she sustained injuries, hence the assault, and then accused of violently raping her. During court, the injuries were mentioned. The man, representing himself, objects. Allegedly, his exact words were so, how do you know that the injuries were from when I pushed her down and not from when I graped her? From what I heard, the judge's face was priceless. Several years ago I was doing a civil trial personal injury, defending a woman who allegedly hit a bus matron with her car. We had offered to concede liability and just try damages in other words. The jury wouldn't hear the circumstances of how the injury happened, just that we agreed my client caused the injury, and they would only decide the amount of damages. We had evidence that the plaintiff was significantly exaggerating her injuries. The plaintiff's attorney refused to agree to our concession thinking that if the jury heard the circumstances they'd want to give even more money to punish my client. So we went to trial on liability. The plaintiff called one witness, her client, who testified that an older woman in a green car hit her. They rested and I moved for a dismissal for failure to prove a case. There was literally no evidence connecting my client to this incident, just an older woman in a green car. The plaintiff never bothered to call my client to the stand. The attorney told the judge that the bus driver had written down my client's license plate and gave it to the police. They never bothered trying to find the bus driver. The attorney asked if she could just put the police report in and I objected that it was hearsay. The attorney then actually said please just let me put this in. I haven't had work in a while and I got retained by a firm to try this case. I really need to win this. Of course I didn't agree and the judge dismissed the case. I felt a little bad for her, but that was maybe the worst presentation of a case I ever saw. I spoke with the jury afterwards, and they all said they hated the plaintiff, didn't believe a word she said, and likely would have found in my favor anyway. Moral of the story, be prepared in court. <laughs> Not a lawyer, but I was in traffic court and a cab driver had got a ticket for running a red. He argued that it was really difficult to see, because the sun was rising morning right where the light was. He was traveling west. Lawyer here. During an order of protection hearing the 6 feet 3 muscular tattooed idiot told the judge that my 5 feet 1 female client deserved the black eye he gave her because she wouldn't stop running her mouth. He actually expected the judge to be sympathetic or something. The second he admitted to hitting her the judge cut him off and said order of protection granted. Next case. Apostrophe. Not in court, but a conversation in my office. It doesn't matter if you were sober or not. You jumped out of a third story window with a beer bottle and threw it at a cop. The jury is going to think you were drunk. Also, I think you were drunk. Edit. Actual lawyer here. Hands down the most ridiculous argument I've ever heard was a constitutionalist, pro-SE defendant trying to explain why the court lacked jurisdiction over him. I was prepared for the standard arguments about freemen on the land, non-corporate natural person, admiralty court, etc. But this one was different. This particular defendant was part of a Jehovah's Witness compound and happened to be Marshallese American I. E. He was black. After the court patiently explained to him that it has jurisdiction over all persons in the county, the defendant promptly piped up that, under the Dred Scott decision, he wasn't a person and the court had no jurisdiction. Prosecutor here. Had a case where a man graped his 6 year old daughter because she wore suggestive clothing and seemed to be asking for it. He tried to argue that you know, girls are just sexually active at a younger age now. I remember thinking. What would Dexter do? Anyway, man got convicted and is now serving 2 life sentences plus 100 years. Edit, the reason for, that sentence is, that he will not be eligible for parole. He was convicted of two counts of grape, two counts of incest, and two counts of aggravated child molestation.
In my jurisdiction you're eligible for parole or a life sentence after 30 years life and life without parole are two different sentences. Here, he was not eligible for life without parole. So in theory at least, yes he could serve two consecutive life sentences which would be 60 years and then parole. Now, however, we are certain he never draws another breath as a free man. I've done several of these cases, and to me, they're much harder than murder cases, because of the pressure. In this case, the man had no other complaints than this as a father. So if I lost, the poor girl goes back to grappa's dad. Not so much ridiculous as ghastly, but, a man accused of raping his own daughter saying he couldn't have done so, because he had a 9 inch cock, and it would have caused her damage, and that the physical signs of sexual activity, that she did exhibit, were because she'd been screwing the family dog. I don't do criminal law anymore, that was enough for me. Edit. Lots of people asking what happened. Should probably have put that in here originally. I'd left the firm by the time it actually got to trial, but was kept in the loop about the case by friends still there. He was found guilty, and went off to prison. Former assistant state attorney slash prosecutor here. This defendant is called up for arraignment and the judge is telling him that he's been charged with theft for stealing a roll of scratch-off tickets from a gas station. The judge informs the defendant that, since the value of the tickets was over $300 therefore it's a felony, rather than a misdemeanor. The defendant says to the judge but your honor, to be fair the tickets were all losers implying it's not theft at all. I was amazed at the ingeniousness, yet futility of the argument. Traffic court, speeding ticket, your honor, I didn't speed, and I can prove it with logic. Judge, a KII. Lady, I drive a Prius. Judge. Lady, that proves I'm responsible. Specifically in the realm of cars. So I obviously wouldn't speed. She had to pay the ticket. Had I have a story for this one. I'm not a lawyer, nor could I talk at the time. During a custody battle between my grandparents and my mom and dad who were addicts. The judge asks, why my parents should have custody, well we are his parents the judge says well you guys, have substance abuse issues no we don't, so you're not using anything, no we are both clean when, is the last time you've used, a few days ago, and we are done now me grandparents won that day in court. This story has been told to me a few times by my grandfather. Actual lawyer. What I dubbed the surprise party defense, in a hearing for an order of protection in which ex-wife is trying to get an order of protection against ex-husband, who had been stalking her. They have a high school age child together. Ex-husband tries to argue against the order of protection by saying they may need to be able to communicate about the child. The judge points out that they can communicate through the child and also that other family members have been put in place by the juvenile court to be intermediaries re-pickup, drop off, etc. Then ex-husband has a brilliant light bulb idea, judge, what if I need to throw my son a surprise party and I need to keep it secret from everyone, but his mom still needs to know, so she doesn't throw a party the same day. In other words, while I admit, have been stalking my ex-wife and that there are grounds to grant an order of protection, you should not grant that order just in case I need to throw a surprise party one day. What made it was how clever he thought the argument was. Thus was born, the surprise party defense. Edit, a lot of you are upset about the comment of communicating through the child. That was probably a poor way to phrase it. In this situation the father would be barred from passing messages to the mother through the child. He can't say, tell your mom ex, but, of course, some indirect communication is going to occur, and that is what the judge was referring to. In other words, the father cannot argue that he needs to be able to have direct communication with the mother for purposes of coordinating child care, things like that which is often the issue. Because the child in this case is old enough to tell both parents for example, about school, friends, trips, grades, etc. It is not as if the judge ordered the child to be the intermediary, that is ridiculous. Also, I sort of simplified the complexities of it, because these people's parental arrangement was not the point. The dumbness of the argument was the point. But this is a criminal judge determining an order of protection. There is a whole separate juvenile slash family court judge that actually determines the custody arrangement and things of that nature. The bottom line is, the guy was trying to use the kid as an excuse. 
to avoid an order of protection, so he could continue to stalk and harass his ex-wife. I'm a prosecutor now, but I used to have a private practice where I did a lot of evictions. My usual landlord clients wouldn't even come into my office until their tenants had been behind for months, and most of the time the tenants were defiant in their non-payment, so it wasn't difficult to not take pity on them. Anyway, one tenant was a particularly dumb guy. He usually came to court dressed in a wife beater and cute off jeans. We had a trial date set, and my client and I showed up. Tenant did not. At the last second before the judge entered a default, some woman comes bursting into the courtroom and yells, Daryl's on the phone. The judge allows her to bring the phone up, and we put tenant on speaker. He proceeds to ask the judge to delay the trial for one week because my brother got his head knocked inside out and is probably gone die. I didn't buy it, but my client knew Daryl well enough to sense the stress and fear in his voice. I told the judge that we would allow the continuance, but only until the next available court day. The judge set it for one week out. I still didn't believe Daryl until that night my grandfather was in an accident, and we had to rush to the hospital. As we are walking up the hallway, I see Daryl in a room with a bunch of people who dressed like him enough to obviously be family. When we get to my grandpa's room he ended up being not as seriously injured as we originally feared. The first thing he says is, you'll never guess what happened to the guy down the hall. Nurse told me his idiot brother dropped a tractor bucket on his head and opened it like a cracked egg. He's in a coma now. I relayed the news to my client and she felt sorry enough for Daryl that we signed an agreement stating that he would clear out within 15 days and we would forgive all back rent owed. This never made it to court. I asked my divorce lawyer what was the worst thing a client had asked him to argue. I was expecting a I want the salad spinner sort of story. He had a client, a professor in his 70s who was divorcing from his wife, also a professor in her 70s. They were both Jewish. His wife had a tattoo on her arm. It was a number put there by the Nazis when they put her in a concentration camp in WW2 as a child. Husband was born in the US, was not German. The German government was in the process of settling a case with the survivors. She had some amount of money, a six figure sum, due to her. The husband wanted his lawyer to argue that he should get half the settlement money. Lawyer told him that there was a special circle in hell for lawyers who ask for stuff like that and that he was not planning on ending up there. Also a lawyer had opposing counsel try to argue that because a landlady had written on her eviction notice it has been a pleasure getting to know you but please leave but had testified they were awful tenants that she hated, that she was dishonest and nothing she said could be trusted opened the question of dishonesty wide up, although landlady wasn't an angel, tenants had an enormous string of fraud priors we could tell the court about as a result. Edit because of confusion around impeachability doors, this is UK law, and relates to gateways for admissibility of bad character evidence. Not a lawyer, but when my mom was killed by a drunk driver, we were filing a wrongful death suit, and the lawyer for the defense used my mom's cancer to say that she was going to die anyways, so a wrongful death dispensation was not owed. Made a left turn on a green turn arrow, a city bus ran a red and t-boned me. My car was a little VW rabbit so it just scooted me, and I was perfectly fine. Driver pulls over, comes out and says the sun was in my eyes. I say I'm not hurt, thanks for asking. Police arrive, and guess what? There was a literal busload full of witnesses. Everyone had the same story. She ran a red. City paid for my car, etc. She denied wrongdoing, and went to court, which I had to attend along with a witness or two and the officer. Her defense? She had a migraine. Judge, so I should let you off the hook, because you had a bad headache, and was driving into the sun. Driver, yes, your honor I'm glad you understand. She got her commercial vehicle license revoked. Should have just taken the points. Waiting for my case, to be called I heard a wild argument. It was a domestic violence case and the petition a person seeking protection was accusing respondent ex-boyfriend of abuse, specifically he headbutted her. Respondent argued back by saying seriously, honestly judge, I couldn't have, because look at my head, it's huge. A head this big would leave mark. Honestly judge look at my head. To which the judge responded, son, I have a big head. Look at my head. 
This went on for a minute. Now the story doesn't stop here. It just gets better. The respondent then argues that petitioner is keeping him from seeing their daughter and that she went as far as putting her uncle as the baby's father on the birth certificate. At this point I look around with shock. The clerk's mind is slowly grasping what he said and the judge nods his head with a typical Tuesday smirk.